In Panama City, Panama, a taxi ministry is making a positive impression on people. Vehicles are identified by a label that reads, Safe Taxi, Seventh-day Adventist Church. As soon as passengers enter an Adventist taxi, they are met with a special greeting followed by an inspirational message from a CD played by the driver. The message encourages the rider to love God and to study His Word. On Fridays, the last ride of the day is given free of charge. Drivers use the opportunity to explain to the passengers that the Sabbath will begin soon and that they will be heading home to welcome it. Some schools and communities on the east coast of Australia have been fortunate to visit a one-of-a-kind museum, one on wheels that brings history to life. Dr. Wayne French converted a semi-truck to create the King Tut Roadshow with the goal of taking this mobile museum to remote areas where schools don't have access to larger museums. In the three sections within the semi-truck, visitors are able to view and handle artifacts, including a life-size replica of the Rosetta Stone, a reproduction of King Tut's tomb, and genuine bricks from Babylon with King Nebuchadnezzar's name stamped on them. While entertaining and educational, this unique center of influence has a deeper purpose of introducing individuals to the validity of the scriptures and to meaningful spiritual questions. Dr. Edward Urbina in Central California, United States, heads up another type of mobile center of influence. The volunteers in this program offer free dental and vision care, following Christ's example of performing acts of service. Mobile clinics are set up at local churches using equipment that is transported in a large trailer. This ministry has a dual reach. Not only are they touching the lives of the people they serve, but also of those they serve with. One third of the volunteers are professionals who are not Adventists. Some become intrigued about why the center offers its free services, and they want to learn more about the church's beliefs. Ellen White stated the urgency of reaching the vast population in big cities. She wrote, let not the fields lying in the shadow of our doors, such as the great cities in our land, be lightly passed over and neglected. The present time is the most favorable opportunity that we shall have to work in these fields. Are you inspired to use a vehicle to take a ministry to those in need within your city? Visit the Mission to the Cities website for more stories on mobile centers of influence. Father in heaven, thank you for this wonderful morning once again. Thank you for the opportunity. As we separate for classes, please guide us and send your Holy Spirit down to us, Lord. Thank you for all that you do. In your heavenly name, amen. Thank you, Josh. Yeah, it's a pretty awesome thing to have the Holy Spirit, isn't it? The Comforter. Keeps us in check, keeps us focused on spiritual things, and keeps our mortal minds off of carnal things if we ask for the Holy Spirit to be with us every day, right? So let's pray again before we start our lesson study. Heavenly Father, Empty us of ourselves this morning, Lord, and fill us with your Holy Spirit as we open your word and we study together, Lord, that we could be on the same page, that we could be of the same mind and the same focus, Lord, to focus on your truth and what you want to teach us from your word today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, 
So for our study this week, we're going to team up with the Holy Spirit to consider the hard questions about the state of the dead, and we're going to explore solid biblical answers to these questions. It's important to understand the state of the dead because there's so much confusion in, in different denominations and different beliefs about where, what happens to us after we die. What happened to the saints in the Bible that we read about after they died? What happened to Jesus after he died? You know, we got to clear up these questions and, and be on the same page so that we can all understand together and that we can help people to focus and, and to, to zero in on what God wants us to know about what happens to us and where we, uh, where we go after we die. So we have some odd stories in the Bible, don't we? We're going to start off with one of them in Luke chapter 16 where Jesus tells a story to his disciples. He says in Luke 16, starting at verse 1 and 2, Jesus said to his disciples, There was a certain rich man who had a steward, and an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. So he called him and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be steward. So why is this manager, this steward, being fired? Okay, he was a poor manager, right? He wasted his manager's assets. So that's a, a legitimate reason to let him go, isn't it? Poor management. In verse 3, tells us, Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my master is taking the stewardship away from me. I cannot dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. So he doesn't want to do hard labor. He doesn't want to do manual labor. And he's ashamed to go beg. So how is he going to make a living? How am I going to earn a living, he's thinking, right? And verse 5 through 7 says, So he called every one of his master's debtors to him. And he said first, said to the first, How much do you owe my master? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. So he said to him, Take your bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. Then he said to another, And how much do you owe? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and write 80. So what do you think about this master's solution, this steward's solution to the problem of being a poor manager to start with? Short-lived at best? Is it honest or is it dishonest? Straight dishonest, right? absolutely dishonest it reflects the reason I think why he was fired in the first place and he doesn't put the interest of his master first does he it seems that way and verse 8 and 9 tells us so the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly for the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. So who was it that just said this? Who said, I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon? Jesus. Jesus. So what is he trying to teach us from this story? That, that you have to be honest in all your dealings? Is that what he's trying to teach us? What does it seem like he's trying to teach us? If you read this story and then all of a sudden he says, well done. It doesn't seem like he was well done, does it? I guess that's what it seems like, huh? That being dishonest and selfish is okay as long as you're good at it. That's what it seems like on the face, doesn't it? In verse 
10, Luke 16, 10, says, He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Yeah. Okay, to, to understand that better, um, Jesus knows, as the master, he knows what he is due. He knows the debt that uh, is owed to him, right? Do we really owe him anything? We owe him everything, but we owe him nothing. Why? Because he says, I paid the price for you. But the value of what we place on what Jesus did for us reflects how much that means to us in our life. Um, these people that owed the master... And the steward was responsible to make the collections of what was owed to the master. Did the master know he probably wasn't ever going to get paid by any of these people? If they were held to the, the amount that they owed, they weren't going to be able to pay it back, at least not in a timely manner anyway. And so, oh, thanks, Rusty. Forgot about the microphones. Um, and so, do you see where I'm getting? Yeah. The, the shrewd steward said, well, if I tell this guy, I, this guy here could pay, I'm sure, 50%. And this guy here, I'm sure, could pay 80%. Because you notice that they're different amounts. He goes to them and he tells them what he knows they can afford. And so it got paid. Otherwise, it wouldn't have gotten paid at all. And so that's why the master said, well done. You did the right thing. Because what does he call it here in, um, in verse 9? I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon. What is unrighteous mammon? Does anybody understand what unrighteous mammon is? It's the riches of this world. Unrighteous mammon is worldly riches, worldly money. So he says, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. So he tells us then in verse 10, he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much, and he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. So it works both ways, doesn't it? This isn't telling us, it's not really following the story, is it? If we read Luke 16, verse 11 to 13, if we continue on, Jesus reinforces his conclusion that honesty and faithfulness are fundamental, that we have to serve honestly rather than serving a drive to be rich. Do you understand that? Money shouldn't be important to us, is what he's saying. Earthly wealth shouldn't be important to us. What should be important to us is making friends, is uh, bringing people to reconciliation with the master. That should be important to us, right? It seems like Jesus is accidentally telling a story that completely contradicts the point that he's making. 
But he's asking us to look beyond the obvious to understand his point. And his point is that we have to be smarter than the world and that we have to use the world's tools to advance the kingdom of God. So if you don't use the best approach, then we're stealing from God. So how can you give me an example of using the world's tools to advance the kingdom of God? Can anybody think of anything as an example? As we look at the mission story, it, 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 that, that amplifies something in the sense that the man is using his taxi to, to, to bring the message across to people. Um, the man with the bus also is using his bus to spread the message across cities. So those are the worldly things, but it, ampli it can you know, help us to spread the message across. Okay. All right. Does it take money to, um, to send missionaries out into the world? Yeah. It does, doesn't it? Is it important to give to our, our Sabbath School world budget to make this happen? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So we're using tools of the world to advance the kingdom of God. And that's what money is, it's a tool of the world. We shouldn't be hoarding it to ourselves. And uh, it's not, um, there's not a specified amount that we're told to give for, for offering, is there? It's a free will offering. It's a, a gift of free will. So we should use the best approach that we know how in order to advance the kingdom of God using what God blesses us with, even if it's he blesses us with tools of the world. So if you use tools of the world to advance your own kingdom, then that's why Jesus says that... Um, he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. So we have to apply that to our own lives, don't we? There's another weird story here in Luke 16 that starts at verse 19. It talks about a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. He ate very well. I like the way he puts that. He fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus full of, stories, full of sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments of Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus in his bosom. So what do we learn from this story so far? The sick, poor people go to heaven and rich people go to hell? That's what it seems to be saying, right? That's why we have to read on. In verse, chapter 16, verse 24 and 25 says, Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. <laughs> so, in this story, Abraham says that those who did well in life suffer in hell, and those who experience bad things in life get to enjoy heaven. That's exactly what he says, isn't it? So how did Abraham end up in heaven? Was Abraham rich or poor? Rich. He was very rich. He was very rich. And he was a successful man, right? So shouldn't he, of all people, be in hell? <laughs> if he enjoyed the good things in life in this world? So this is another story that makes no sense. It's contrary to the teachings of Moses who links obedience to blessings and disobedience to being cursed. Remember Deuteronomy 28? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So he doesn't say, Moses doesn't say that you'll only be blessed if you're poor in this world. He says you'll be blessed if you're obedient in this world, right? In uh, verse 27 and 28 of Luke 16 says, Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. So what does the rich man want? What is his request? For who? Yeah, for his brothers to be saved. But who's going to go travel to earth and warn the rich man's five brothers? And what's he going to warn them? To stop being rich? Or to stop being greedy? What do you think? Yeah. So what was the problem with the Jews? What was the problem with the Jews? What were they given that was special? Truth. So what was the problem with the Seventh-day Adventist church? Truth. Truth. Okay, so let's, let's apply this, what was given to the Jews. They were given truth. And what did they do with it? Have the truth. We are the ones who are going to be with God. What were they meant to do with the truth? Share. To share, right? They were rich because they were given the truth. But they hoarded it. And they didn't share it with the poor people in the world who didn't have the truth. Mm -hmm. And that's the same thing we should do today. We should share the truth with the poor people in the world who don't have the truth. Amen? Is that what it means to be, to be uh, generous? Yeah. yeah, Modesto. Oh, wait, we need a microphone over there so we can all hear you. Oh, yeah, it's snowing outside, by the way. We need to remember that parables has just one teaching. Each parable, uh, Christ just has, Christ give one teaching. Now, how can we use this uh, parable to those who says that when a person dies, they go to heaven? Because this is what it says. It's, it is saying, uh, just reading it this way, that is what people understand. Right. That's why I'm pointing it out this way. But we're going to get to that conclusion before we finish this. We're going to get to the conclusion of why. Okay. So yeah, don't anybody get confused yet. Because the teaching isn't that the, the poor go to heaven and the rich go to hell. That's not the teaching. But some people take that to mean, mean that that's the teaching. So yeah, thanks for pointing that out. But that's where it starts off. But what it is, is it's a, a spiritual uh, those who have the truth and those who are poor meaning those who need the truth who want the truth who are starving for the truth yeah uh, Sean well, I'm just thinking you, you seem like you kind of got off on a tangent talking about the Seventh-day Adventist Church uh -huh. the church here the church here uh, we're not done yet oh no no the church is we're not this isn't the end yet right No, we need to share the truth. We'll see you tomorrow morning. Yeah. Resurrection. But, you know, it might be like, man, you know, like 50 years later, I'm sitting there thinking, he hasn't come yet. Uh -huh. What am I, you know what I'm saying? We don't right. know when he's coming. Right. But we need to do our part. We need to be the faithful stewards. We need to be the, the, yeah. the shrewd stewards and use the yeah. things of the world to yeah. advance the kingdom. The of the shrewd steward and the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. They're back to back because they're both trying to make the same point, right? Yeah. There's a lot of ammunition in this lesson. Yeah. Right.
That's that's right, and that's a good point. Yeah, yeah, Modesto. I like to be practical. Are we then saying so yes? So we, we have to share the truth that we have, right? Oh, the truth that's that why we I'm, have. I'm speaking. I'm speaking to this group of people right here. Okay, I should have said us. Maybe instead of instead of uh, calling out the whole Seventh Day Adventist Church, I should have said our group right here. Okay. Um, God has people in all the churches. Amen. The problem with people don't understand is those people are in a in a doctrine that leads them to death. We have to, we, we as Adventists have the, have the Sabbath, have the three angels' message, have come out of Babylon, come out of confusion, come out of, 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 of false doctrines. Just because God has people in those churches, he's probably protecting them from us Laodiceans as it is because we, we're, we're, we're all, well, there, you know, you know. But we have a purpose, and if, if we really, truly believe why we're Adventists, why did God put us here on this earth was to give the message to the world. And so when, when, when I have a special message and I see you in a belief that can lead you to death, and I say, man, God, God loves you enough to send me to try to convict you of truth. You know, that's our purpose. Mm -hmm. And if, if we ever lose sight of our purpose, every person out there in this, this world needs to be led to a closer relationship with Jesus. I need to be led to a closer relationship with Jesus. But I found out the only way I get a closer relationship to Jesus is give away Jesus. Yeah. If I keep it to myself, like the rich man, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. He should have went out and picked up Lazarus off the deal and said, hey, come on. Let's, 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 let, let's commune together. Let's eat together. Mm -hmm. let's, 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 let's feast on the truth of God. Instead of letting him just pick up the scraps that fell from his table, right? I mean, the scraps... It, 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 it still left him in darkness. Yeah. So let's, let's continue on with the parable and, and get a little bit more understanding here of what's going on. Let, Abraham says to uh, the rich man, he says, they have Moses and the prophets, his five brothers. He says, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Moses and the prophets. If one goes to them from the dead... They will repent. They was that so? They've rejected him still today. Who was the dead who came to life, and did they still not repent? Jesus yes. came back to life. Yes. He says, if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to them, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded through the one rise from the dead. They're talking about Jesus now. They're not even going to repent after Jesus rises from the dead, right? Because Moses and the prophets pointed to Jesus rising from the dead. Right. So was it about being rich with money? No. Or was it about being rich with God's... They don't won't listen. So... But so many denominations use it to, to try... And the prophets... Because they reject Moses and the that's prophets. That's the reason. They, that's the reason you take that text and you read it the way you want to read it because you've rejected Moses and the prophets. Right. This isn't a story about the state of the dead. And just like Tommy mentioned, the Jews are. You Tommy mentioned the Jews. They added. They added truth, but they kept it to themselves. They suppressed the truth. We. But, no, no, no. They did worse than that. They took the truth and they added to the truth and they made it their own truth. We have the truth. Yeah. It's not God's truth. We have the truth. 
It's our truth. And we, we might find ourselves just like the Jews, you know, doing what we think is right, behaving as if we, we are a special set of people and we keep it to ourselves, not spreading the gospel and spreading it in our own belief, in our own understanding, mm -hmm. not presenting Christ, but presenting what, you know? Yeah. Yeah, Ernie. I just clarify as well that we have a portion of the truth. You know, uh, Ellen White says we'll spend all of eternity studying the themes of salvation. Oh, yeah. So if we're learning about an eternal God, he's given the truth in stages along the way. The Adventist church was given special messages to deliver, but it's yeah. a portion of the truth. Yeah. You know, we're, there's, no, there's no way that we could, you know, we, we don't want to get stuck on a journey. You know, mm -hmm. this is a pilgrimage and a journey, and it's a journey of discovery, it's a journey of learning, it's a journey of becoming more like, and that more like and that learning is progressive. Very progressive for a long, long time, yeah. right? Um, I just want to add, add, the thing is that when we discover light, we have to give that light away. Yeah. We have to. So, That's, that we cannot, it will die, we'll smother the light. If we're not giving it away. That's right. Our, our purpose as human beings are to love the world enough to tell them, come, see what I have seen. Amen. You know, um, and that is a very important thing. We need to, to keep expounding on the truth. We need to keep studying the truth and and uh so that in order that we can help to share that truth uh, there's another story here that we're coming to in luke 23 where one little comma messes us up uh, luke 23 starting at verse 39 to 43 says one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him saying if you are the christ save yourself and us but the other answered rebuking him saying do you not even fear god seeing you're under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we received the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, and I'm going to read it the way it's written, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. That's the way it's written, according to the mechanics of the English grammar, because they put a comma right there. Right. So, so, according to the mechanics of English grammar, who is going to be in paradise today? Who is? He says, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. So who is he saying is going to be in paradise today? The thief and Jesus. He says, you will be in paradise today with me, is what he's saying, according to the way that the comma is placed, right? So, as we've been taught, is it our defense? Have you noticed that that doesn't always work with people? <laughs> you have to uh, assume, and you have to read it the way that it's written, and understand it, by the understanding that the Holy Spirit gives us. Otherwise, you're going to be confused. So, the original Greek doesn't contain punctuation. Which is not... Um, but, but I think, I think God allows that in, 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 in the Bible to make people... If we... Then we... You know, because most of the people that get caught up with the comma there and the Lazarus story don't even in the new testament they, what they want to read they won't read revelation they won't need this stuff so right so it's it's not convincing is it it's not convincing to tell them the comma is just put in the wrong spot and they put in a comma where it shouldn't have been that's not convincing so what we have to do is we have to use the bible to interpret the bible right Amen. is that what you're saying Amen. Yeah. this is this is the we have to create a curiosity in their hearts and it's awful hard when 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 the devil we're fighting the devil's lies 
you know, once saved, always saved. Uh, I don't need any more. I've got all I need. Uh, and they don't have a, a, a zeal to seek after him. This is the difference. This is the part where we have to be. We have to say, hey, I, I, if I don't know, I want to find out. The reason, yeah. reason I'm here where I'm at, because people have asked me questions and I didn't know the answer. So, you gotta, so I, have to go to, I have to find the answers. I don't want to be wrong. you gotta be able to. You got to be able to... Uh, play people in and, and, and get them uh, to where they, they can follow you to the truth, right? If you say, that, ask that question, according to what Jesus said here, who's going to be in paradise today? And they'll say, well, the thief on the cross. And who else? He said, you will be with me in paradise today, right? So Jesus and the thief. If, he, if that today means today, okay? And so they're going, they're going, okay, yeah, yeah, you're right. So then you go to John 20, in verse 15 to 17, where it tells us a story. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Who are you seeking? This is on Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary, can you... She, she didn't think this was somebody who knew her. And for the first time, I think she realized, whoa, this isn't the gardener. He says, Mary. And she turned to him and she said, Rabbani, teacher, master. You know, she, she says, and Jesus said to her, do not cling to me for, why? I have not yet ascended to my father but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. So Jesus hadn't gone and presented his sacrifice to God yet. And what day was it? Sunday. Two days later. If Jesus was going to be in heaven today on Friday, why did he tell Mary on Sunday, I haven't gone to heaven yet? Is that convincing? That he didn't mean today? He said, what's that? If you have an open if mind? If you have an open heart and you're, you're praying to know God's will, and you know that church dogma changed the theology to put you in purgatory or take you out, that was the concept there. Mm -hmm. And they made money on that. Yeah. It's about the dollar. So, so just ask people, what does this say about Jesus visiting his father in paradise on Friday? If he says on Sunday, I haven't gone there yet. Exactly. And what Jesus is saying, or was saying to the, 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 the thief on the cross, he was saying today is salvation. He says today is, is, is the day that we, um, the acceptable time of salvation, today. Well, I got, so, I got so, a better one for you here. So today, okay? salvation has come to him. I, yeah, I've got a better explanation for that for you here in a second. But first I want to point out that this fact that Jesus told Mary he hadn't ascended to heaven yet, and it was two days after he was crucified, it doesn't turn on punctuation. It doesn't, it doesn't matter that there was a comma put in the wrong spot because Jesus said, I haven't gone to heaven yet. Yeah. Um, and the, the point Jesus is making at the cross wasn't about timing, was it? It was about salvation. Amen. So the point to Mary was specifically about the timing of Jesus' return to heaven. His return wasn't until after he resurrected on Sunday to go present his sacrifice to his father. And second, the phrase that you were talking about, I say to you today... I say to you today, look it up. It's a Hebrew saying that expresses certainty. It's like saying, take it, you can take it to the bank. I say to you today, I say to you today that I will pay my debt before the end of the month. I say to you today that I will be good for this debt. Um, it's a Hebrew saying. And Jesus said to the thief on the cross those exact words. I say to you today. 
He's saying, I, you can take it to the bank. If I tell you, you can take it to the bank, do I expect you to go to the bank? No. No, you can take it to the bank. That's just a, that's just a metaphor, right? That's just a saying. You can take it to the bank. It means you can bet on it. You can bank on it. It's good. I say to you today, it's good. It's going to happen. I say to you today. So, Jesus is using this Hebrew expression that you can be certain of your salvation. You can be certain of your salvation. I say to you today. Okay, that's, that's what it means. He's not saying, I say to you, today you shall be in heaven. He's saying, I say to you today, you will be in heaven. You can take it to the bank. You will be in heaven. Is what he's saying, right? You can be certain that you will be in heaven with me. Because right there and there, he accepts Jesus as, yeah. as the... As his savior. He addressed him as God. He said, yes. Lord, remember me when you enter your kingdom. Yes. In 1 Peter, we have a, an example of preaching to spirits here. 1 Peter 3, verse 18 to 20. Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Who formerly were disobedience once when the divine long suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. So, who are the spirits in prison? Who are the spirits in prison? So, if you ask a lot of professed Christians out there, they'll tell you the spirits in prison are people in hell. Who are the spirits in prison? According to what the scripture says, it's those who didn't listen to the warnings of Noah. The sinners who didn't listen to the warnings of Noah. So Jesus, we're being told because of this passage by some professed Christians, that Jesus went to hell to preach to spirits in hell. People that were in hell. After his death but before his resurrection. So sometime between Friday and Sunday, Jesus went down to hell and he preached to people in hell. That's not what it says, is it? Let's focus on verse 18 and 19. Verse 18 and 19 says, Christ also suffered once for sins, the, unjust, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive by the Spirit, by whom he also went and preached to the spirits in prison. So, the he in verse 19 is the Holy Spirit, right? The natural reading of this is that Jesus preached through the Holy Spirit. Do you agree? Jesus preached through the Holy Spirit. The next question is, is why do some people think Jesus did this while he was dead? After he died on the cross. Because the text doesn't say that anywhere, does it? In verse 20, 1 Peter 3.20, remember it said, Who formerly, these spirits who, who he preached to, were formerly disobedient once, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah. When? In the days of Noah. While the ark was being prepared. In which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. So this answers the when question. It was during the days of Noah when God was being patient during those 120 years. Waiting and hoping that people would come to the truth. And believe and give their hearts back to God. Okay? That's pretty simple, isn't it? It has nothing to do with Jesus going to hell after he died on the cross. It says nothing about that in 1 Peter 20, 3.20. Um, in Isaiah 14, verse 16 and 17 says, Those who see you will gaze at you and consider you, saying, Is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world as a wilderness and destroyed its cities, who did not open the house of his prisoners? It's talking about the devil, right? So are sinners in prison? Yes. 
Yes. Yes. Isaiah makes it clear that the sinners in the world are in prison. They're in bondage. They're in prison. We see this throughout the Bible. That sin is bondage, isn't it? Sin is being in prison. When, when Jesus comes back as a thief and he binds the strong man so he can take back what belongs to him. He's talking about us, right? So he's taking us out of prison. It makes it clear Jesus did not visit hell before his inner incarnation. Jesus worked through the Holy Spirit to plead with Noah's audience that they might be saved. And then Revelation 6 talks about spirits under the altar. That's another confusing one, right? Another one that's written uh, in a way that doesn't really make sense unless you, you think of it as an illustration. Um, Revelation 6, verse 9 to 11 says, When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. Totally doesn't make sense if you're thinking about a, a living, breathing group of people, does it? It's one of the most difficult passages, at least on the surface, because it specifically refers to conscious souls in heaven who've been martyred for their faith. Yeah. And they're able to have intelligent conversations according to what John said in Revelation, right? According to the text. So do they have bodies? They must have bodies if they're given white robes, right? And told to go back to sleep. Told to rest a little while longer. So... If they have bodies, it would mean they were resurrected, right? It's before, if you look at the context, this is before the second coming of Jesus. Otherwise, they wouldn't be complaining about the lack of a judgment. So their resurrection is before the second coming of Jesus, supposedly. So if we just stopped here, is this story inconsistent with the doctrine of soul sleep? That the dead await the resurrection of the second coming? It is, isn't it? While we, while we were studying this lesson, Sam, it brought me back to Cain and Abel. Mm -hmm. When Cain killed Abel and the Lord said to Abel... His blood cried out from the ground. Yeah, you know. Did Cain's blood cry out from the ground? <laughs> no. It did not cry out. So, it's... It did metaphorically, metaphorically get cried out from the ground. Right. It's just, it's just like the, the, the spirit. <laughs> this is the problem with, with trying to interpret it without the whole Bible. If, if the Bible doesn't break, does not contradict itself. When I go here, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, mm -hmm. automatically that goes to me in my mind. Uh, all of us are in prison. All of us are in Egypt. All of us are this way. So, the, you know, the Spirit comes and preaches us to us and we're trying to draw us out of prison. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And that's, that's really important to understand. Um, you know, also, we understand that there were some exceptions about resurrection, right? Because we understand that the Moses was resurrected. And we understand that there was a, a resurrection that happened after Jesus' resurrection. We studied about that previously, right? Yeah. Resurrection of the saints. Um, around the city. So uh, let's re examine a few details, okay? In Revelation 6 10, um, according to Revelation 6 10, does it seem reasonable that people are going to be complaining in heaven? Mm -mm. I don't think so. Not what, not what, according to what Revelation says. Are they going to be seeking vengeance? No. In Luke twenty three thirty four, 
Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. Forgive them. The spirit of forgiveness. Same spirit we're going to have when we're in heaven, right? In Acts 7, 59 to 60, says, They stoned Stephen, and he was calling on God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. Died in the spirit of forgiveness, right? He was a martyr, and he's not going to be crying for the blood of those who stoned him. He asked for forgiveness for them before he died. When he said this, he fell asleep, it tells us. And in Revelation 6, 9 says, When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. So if you have complaints in heaven, would it be understandable for those complaints to come from those who are forced to live under the altar? Maybe. What does it mean to live under the altar? What does the Old Testament tell us in Leviticus? That's the only, only verse that I could find that remotely even referenced living under the altar. And that's where it says, uh, Leviticus 4.18, where the priest will put blood on the horns of the altar, which, he is, which is before the Lord, and which is in the tabernacle of the meeting, and he shall pour the remaining blood at the base of the altar, beneath the altar of the burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. So... The base of the altar is symbolic of where these souls that John saw in Revelation lived, right? <clears throat> what do you got, Ernie? We use the symbol of, of being covered with Jesus' blood. Right. You know? Being covered and with so Jesus' blood. The altar was <clears throat> that experience of justification, that experience of redemption through Jesus' blood. It makes perfect sense mm -hmm. that people would cry out from, their, from their, the unjust spot of persecution underneath the blood of Jesus you know the breath. that's right yep and so it, it's a lot easier to understand when you understand it that way so thanks for pointing that out um, in so verse 11 Revelation 6 11 says then a white robe was given to each of them and it was said to them that they should rest a while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed we already read this one but I was just going over it again so that we can consider the the response to their complaint, go back to sleep, right? Go back to sleep. And that, that's not consistent with them living in heaven, is it? With them living in paradise. So this is another symbolic verse that we see, like Cain's blood crying out from the ground, right? Or like Abel's blood crying out from the ground. Um, so we can't take this literally, can we? We have to believe that it's symbolic, because it doesn't literally make sense according to the Bible. But symbolically, it makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? So these details, since they're symbolic, they say nothing about the state of the dead. Okay? So Christians, if we know the true answers when we get to heaven, but this side of heaven, we can still be citizens of heaven, right? I think the Bible teaches us the righteous dead sleep until the second coming of Jesus. Amen. Yes, do she? I think your microphone's off. The Sunday's listen kind of talked about, you know, the um, Lazarus, not the Lazarus that died from in the tomb, a different Lazarus and the rich man. All these things, like, it's a metaphor. Mm -hmm. And um, nothing, con Bible never contradicts anything. God never created a Bible to contradict anything. Right. So you really have to study, the, study it in depth of the state of the dead yeah. before you even get into the lesson. That's and right. that's, that's how it all comes together. It yep. weaves together. It's like a puzzle coming pieces coming together and make it as a beautiful story mm -hmm. so that's what God's word is and that's why he wants us to study because he doesn't want us to read one passage and just like uh, accept oh that's what it is you know because it's a confusion then Amen. so that's why in-depth study is vital thanks Dushi okay well our next Bible study lesson next week is the title, The Fires of Hell, and that ought to be another good uh, truth-wrenching 
study that we have, and I'm looking forward to to uh, looking at that lesson. Now, I won't be here next Sabbath, so I'll be looking for anybody who was willing to stand up and give the lesson. And um, Sean, okay, good, thank you, sir. Um, but this has been a, a, a good study, a good a refresher, and hopefully eye-opener for, for all of us who are here today, and I appreciate you all coming and sharing with me today. So let's all pray before we go into our church worship. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for opening our eyes again this morning, for bringing us together in one spirit and in your spirit, Lord, the spirit of truth. We pray, Father, that we could share the truths that we glean from these lessons with those who are seeking the truth, Lord, that they could have a clear understanding of your love for us and your plan for our salvation. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen.